Hello, Internet. We are live. Hey, everyone. We have with us today Dan Piero Piero and our guest today Jacopo Talia Bue. Sorry, I, I practiced his name a lot, but you know I still messed it up <laughs> during the actual <laughs> seminar. So um, he's going to be talking to us today about um, ML ops at reasonable scales. So as always, the plan is going to be a thirty-minute podcast, uh, thirty-minute talk followed by a thirty-minute podcast-style discussion, where you in the live chat can uh, ask questions on the YouTube uh, live chat. Um, and a little bit about our speaker today. So uh, Jacopo is a, a lead scientist at Coveo, which is uh, a company that uh, you know is in the ML ops space. And he, before this, he was a, a CTO at uh, Tussol, which was acquired by Coveo. So he he's been around the block in terms of you know understanding ML ops and industry and kind of uh, the impact that can have for for companies. Uh, and today he's going to talk to us about uh, doing ML ops at a reasonable scale, which is a pretty intriguing talk title. So. Uh, Jacobo, take it away. Thanks so much. And thanks, Guy, for you know, spending some time with, uh, with me today. Uh, let's, uh, let's go into, uh, into the talk. Uh, so we have uh, kind of full 30 minutes ahead of us, but please interrupt me or ask questions or say anything that you, know, uh, you want to say if what, I, what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. Uh, we're going to talk a bit, you know, who we are, uh, because we're maybe a bit less uh, known than some other companies or people that have talked to this nice um, series before. Uh, we're going to define, you know, the famous reasonable scale. Well, it's not famous, but it's going to be famous after my talk today. But what do we mean by reasonable scale and why, why we think it's important? And then we're going to give you some example of what we call the ML ops without ops, as in how can you actually leverage, the, you know, the best tools in this thriving ecosystem um, to actually achieve incredible things uh, with very small resources. And then finally, some unsolicited opinions about what the future will hold for the space. But you know, since you invited me, now you have to get my opinion as well. So um, what is Coveo? Uh, Coveo is a Canadian unicorn, which I think, I don't know, flying moose or you know, magic, magic deer. I don't, know, I don't know what is the equivalent of that. Um, but it's a company founded in Canada with offices in Canada, United States, and, and UK. Um, we raised more than $300 million in the last three years. And what Coveo does is a B2B uh, company. Uh, this is not just, a, I mean, this is a marketing slide, but it's not just a marketing slide. Is what I'm going to say in the, you know, in, in today actually reflects back to, to this fundamental aspect of our business. Compared to other companies or other people that are doing a lot of incredible work in this space, we do not sell directly to customers. Uh, since we're going to talk a lot about e-commerce today, we're not like Amazon. Like we do not own an e-commerce, so that so that when we build models, we don't build models for our customers. What we do is that we power we power other e-commerce, so people that have a shop, okay, and they want to give to their shopper like a good ML, you know, powered experience. We give them API and models and the means for them to compete in this digital economy. This is very important because it means that we do not really um, optimize. In, a, in an end-to-end -end fashion on one website because we don't own any website. But what we do is that we need to build robust pipelines that work across hundreds of clients and you know, thousands of deployments, okay? So for us, MLOps is even more important than you know, just ML in particular um, because of the fundamental uh, constraints of our business. In particular, what I do at Coveo, I uh, am leading our AI effort uh, and Coveo, you know, our AI team at Coveo has a significant roadmap of the research side in AI information retrieval, natural language processing. Uh, if you have been to one of these conferences before, you probably have the misfortune of, you know, hearing my, you know, my annoying voice before. Uh, and if you're gonna, I don't know, go an ACL uh, next month, uh, we're gonna be there. And we uh, had our 15 minutes of, you know, celebrity last month when we won the best paper at NACL um, through a collaboration between industry and academia. So while we're not gonna talk about ML or research or anything at all today, we're gonna to talk about engineering. Uh, it's important for, for us to, have, to understand that when we want to be more effective in building tools, that applies you know, when we actually try to build products, but also when we do research. So what do we mean by doing AI at reasonable scale? Um, the reasonable scale is a, is a fuzzy and you know, somehow you know, vague term. And we're gonna try and introduce it along some dimensions. Uh, this is not a, meant to be a perfect definition, 
mostly because we just made up the old thing. So, you know, <laughs> it's, not, it's not that we're constrained in any way. Um, but it kind of gives you, if you really, if you really know the digital economy, it should give you some pointers, you know, some general, you know, um, points in this landscape to kind of detect or see when there's reasonable scale. So the first and easiest way to distinguish the reasonable scale is the computing side, right? Uh, again, let's let's talk about e-commerce because everybody understands and knows e-commerce, even if you don't work in e-commerce, right? So on one side of the e-commerce space, there are companies like Amazon or Alibaba, uh, you know, which, which can have infinite computing budget, right? I mean, in this specific case, they actually own an entire cloud provider, right? And then there are companies, you know, which are much smaller that, you know, they have to actually budget, you know, a finite amount of competition when they need to consider their ML investment. On the team side, so, you know, say number of people that can, that can actually do ML, uh, again, you have the, you know, the big tech of this world with hundreds of thousands in some cases of people and people at reasonable scale, you know, have to make do with, you know, with, with dozens or, you know, tens of them. Uh, on the revenue side, you can define the reasonable scale as being this, the scale of the hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Uh, I think Amazon makes 300 billion altogether to give you like, like a sense of, you know, the distance uh, between, you know, the, 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 the first rank of the power law and everybody else. Uh, but again, if you think of e-commerce as, as, um, as a general case, you're going to observe this huge power law in which you're like 10 giant player and then the bulk of the market which is big enough for, for them to invest in ML. Uh, but of course, they're not you know, you know, a, as huge as Amazon in terms of you know, the amount of revenue they make. And finally, data. Uh, since we're talking about ML, data is, you know, data is the new oil and blah, blah, blah. And one thing you find at reasonable scale is that there's, there's still significant amount of data, let's say in the terabyte side, uh, but we're definitely not uh, you know, collecting you know, petabytes of data uh, every day. Of course, all these four things are heavily correlated together, right? As you, as you can imagine, like, you know, if you have a finite amount of computing, it prob it's probably the case that, you know, you're not gonna make, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue. If your team size is, you know, 25 people, you know, you probably don't have, you know, a petabyte a day to, 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 to compute. But, but still, there are some exception, right? There are some companies which are at reasonable scale for some of these parameters and, and, and not for others. Uh, I don't know, that typically depends on what you do, but let's say if you do ad tech, ad tech is a super you know, computing intensive business. There's a lot of data in ad tech, but that doesn't mean that you, that you, need, to, you need to have like you know, hundreds of people working for you. Uh, so as a, as, a general, uh, as a general quadrant of trying to put uh, you know, people in, in the space um, along this, you know, these two axes, you know, scale on one side and you know, ML proficiency on the other for, for the lack of a better term, uh, so we, we can start um, distinguishing between, you know, people, let's say top right, we call them the leaders and let's say are the company like, you know, the Amazon, the Google, the Netflix of this world, right? Uh, they're not at reasonable scale. They're really not. And they don't need much help with ML proficiency. Right? These people as humongous scales and they already kind of solve most of the problems they had. Otherwise, they wouldn't be, you know, who they are. Um, on the, on the bottom right, you have the early adopters. So the people that actually need some help in ML, because these are people they may be, you know, kind of sophisticated, let's say Tuzo, you know, our previous company. So the company is built by data people and it deals with data every day, terabytes of data, but of course you don't have humongous resources. So we built Tuzo five years ago. And one thing that I always say to people is that if we had to rebuild Tuzo now, we wouldn't pick any of the tools that we picked five years ago. So it's been just five years, but in terms of the ML landscape and the you know engineering and general uh, tooling, it's kind of like you know it's kind of like twenty years. And of course, we need help. And there's a lot of things we're gonna say today for people that are like you know sophisticated enough to run you know complex ML models. Uh, but again, there are some constraints in the number of people or the number of resources that they have. On the bottom left. You know, is the easiest category of all are the small animals. Let's say again, if you, if you take the e-commerce as a, as a as a metaphor, you're gonna have the people at the very extreme of this of this power law. So people that have maybe a, a, a shop that is small enough for that for machine learning not to be not even clear if machine learning really helps. Right below a certain scale, it may be the cost of maintenance or even just the cost of you know structuring your company in such a way as to run a good recommender system may actually not even be worth you know the amount of lift you have. And finally, in the top left, we have what we call late adopters, which are typically companies that are super successful 
and super brilliant in their own field, um, but they're kind of not digital in their DNA. So they actually started um, doing ML uh, and investing in this like pretty recently. And they need help. They don't need help for the same reason that Tuzon needs help, as in they actually have a lot of resources and they, you know, and they are really leaders in the market, but they need help because they're not machine learning native company. And so by having, you know, good ML tools, they actually can, you know, speed up the adoption of the machine learning stuff in their own company. And of course, I mean, if you wonder why we're even giving this talk is that we as a company at Tuzo before, and now of course at Coveo and a much bigger, you know, unicorn scale, because we are in somewhat of a privileged position of being able to observe, you know, the digital transformation of more traditional company, of working with some of the leading company in the world. And of course, you know, in the case of Tuzo, of acquiring or working with small companies, which goes on the early adopters kind of phase. Um, so everything we're going to say today comes from years of experience and dozens and dozens of, you know, real interaction with people all across this landscape. So why uh, the reasonable scale is, 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 is an interesting thing? Well, not, not just because, of course, this is our work, but um, this is the um, amount of publication in e-commerce track on some of the elite conferences in 2020. This is the amount of papers that you know, this company has produced on the industry um, uh, practitioner. So this is not university, just people from industry. Uh, if, you, if you actually made the calculation and you look at this, at this graph, it turns out that basically every company here, well, except one, but you know, that's kind of irrelevant. Every company here is not a company at a reasonable scale by any definition of reasonable scale that we just gave, right? If you look at a company actually innovating in e-commerce are the Amazon, the Alibaba, the Home Depot, and the Etsy of this world. Uh, they do incredible things. Uh, and and you know, we, we really enjoy going to conferences and listen to, you know, to their talks and see what their innovation are. But there's clearly a lack I mean, there's clearly a gap in the market, not in the market of you know, money, but in the market of ideas for what happens at a scale that is not you know, the, the Amazon or the Alibaba one. If you, if you consider that the only company, again, among, among the top 10 in, in the e-commerce stack, um, that is not there's just one company that is reasonable and the other one are reasonable, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of barriers to entry that you can identify um, for that to be the case, right? Uh, so one engineering, which is what, you know, what today is about, is that big data companies can deploy very complex model. And of course, they have this huge infrastructure that works super well. There's computing, which is you know, how much money on GPUs typically these days you can spend on stuff. There's talent, which is you know, typically big companies tend, tend to attract the most talented engineers and data scientists. And finally, there are some specific machine learning barriers to entry. So the first one is models from the literature are very rarely representative of real life scenarios. Uh, if, if Amazon, you know, improve the recommender system, they publish a nice paper, I don't know, Siga Yari Com, and, and it's an outstanding paper and we all like it, but it turns out that if you try and take that model and apply it to a shop that makes hundreds of millions of dollars, it may not even work in the same way, right? So while this is an incredible research and it's something is clearly that is pushing the field forward, is not pushing the entire field forward. It's pushing a very you know, tiny niche segment of the field forward. The second problem that we have is that data sets do not really capture the, the properties of the reasonable scale. Uh, an example that I always like to make, again, from, from Siga Yair, I think it was three years ago, uh, there was a paper from a huge uh, uh, Japanese e-commerce. And, and the problem is what was, was the following, like giving some clicks on the website can you predict if the if the shopper is going to buy something at the end of the at the end of the of the session? Right? It's, it's called intent prediction. It's a standard e-commerce problem. And the way in which these people did it, which was deep learning at the time, was you know the first deep learning paper on this, and it was awesome. But then when you look at the data set, you find out that the target class, the conversion, basically, um, was twenty six percent of the entire uh, data set, and twenty six percent is approximately ten times more than a normal conversion rate. So of course, when you try to apply the very same model to what happens in a real website, in a website at a reasonable scale, this doesn't work. Because now the, you know, your target class is not 26% of the entire data set, it's actually 2.5%. And, and there's a lot of examples that I can make like this. So today, I won't have any answer for you on basically all these problems uh, that, that requires other talks and a lot, of, you know, a lot more time. 
Uh, the only thing we, we're going to try and see is that, well, can we make it so that all companies, not just you know, big tech, can kind of deploy and work with complex model pipelines? And it's going to be, I mean, it is an optimistic talk. Like, you know, like the, the subtitle of this talk is that you don't need a bigger both. Um, and it's the entire idea that for the first time, thanks to the growing ecosystem of tool, you know, in the ML world, um, we can actually have very small team achieve incredible ML things at scale uh, by using, you know, the appropriate tools. So what is important for reasonable company to do? Um, and our, in our experience, we kind of distilled back together to three main like, you know, to three main points, uh, which may sound trivial to, to many of you, but then when you actually go and see, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the reality of it, um, they're actually far less trivial than what it looks like. So the first one is, of course, that data is king. Everybody says that, uh, but I think there has been, I don't know, at least the last five or, or six years in the machine learning world, when there's a lot of obsession about the models. There's a lot of obsession, even when we go to, you know, to conferences and papers, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, models achievement, new architecture, and so on and so forth. In real life, it turns out to be that the marginal gain that you get by having better data is actually significantly bigger, typically, than to have, you know, slight model improvements. And this has been underestimated for, for you know, all sorts of years. I think now Andrew Wang is, is, is doing this, you know, um, a lot of this talk uh, recently, uh, but we as a community, um, um, kind of, I think, kind of underestimated this for years. Uh, this is more important for reasonable companies than for humongous company, for the reason that marginal gains in models tends to become more important when you control the full data pipeline, right? Imagine Amazon again. If Amazon builds a new recommender system and the recommender system is 0.1% more accurate than yesterday, uh, that's going to result in billions of dollars of, of, you know, of revenues. Uh, if a company that makes $100 million of revenues make a margin improvement in the recommender system, that's not going to be the same uh, amount of revenues. So the second point is that PaaS is really better than YAS. So platform as a service is really better than infrastructure as a service. Uh, and this goes back to the scarcest resources that people have at reasonable scales, which is time. Time as in, you know, engineering time, you know, num number of people and, and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of things that now you can use uh, the kind of, you know, austere models or help you run your computation and we're going to see all of them or track your experiments. Um, and they kind of save you a lot of time. They save you the time to actually write the code of them in the first place. Or even if there's an open source solution that does it, you can typically pay a company to host the same open source solution for you. So you don't even have to do that for a very reasonable price. And finally, uh, well, like, you know, a, a good developer experience is paramount to have ML people uh, productive. Um, and we believe that, especially with the latest version of, of you know, some of the, you know, data warehousing and data tools like Snowflake, uh, you know, the increased computation of modern laptops and very easy access to the, to the cloud, um, you can actually kind of get away um, with building incredible ML pipeline without distributed computing. Uh, distributed computing is awesome. And our entire company, Tuzo, when basically built with, you know, this huge Spark SQL uh, thing to make all the computation behind the scene of what's going to happen. But the truth of the matter is, while Spark has been super important for, you know, the big data explosion, um, it's actually very hard to run. I mean, it's, it's not hard, but it turns out that it's slow and kind of clunky uh, to run Spark, even when you run it on, you know, AWS as an EMR, uh, as an EMR job. As in, while everybody, you know, you, you can empower people that knows how to write Python models uh, with Metaflow very easily because at the end of the day, they're just going to run basically what they would run on their laptop, you know, somewhere else. Um, Spark kind of asks you to learn completely different patterns of, of programming, uh, which may or may not necessarily be what people out of university or people in your team know. Uh, again, five years ago, we didn't really have a choice. So we built a company out of Spark. But if we started today, we would never do that. And we'll go directly for, for example, Snowflake. Uh, if we go back and see what happened in, you know, in, 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 in ML, I mean, this is, this is kind of like brief overview, you know, the previous episodes. Um, this is probably a false story, but it's like realistic enough to make the point. Um, the, the, the picture on the right, uh, you probably know it, is, is, is a very famous picture from Google that shows you, you know, how small your model compared to everything that happens, you know, surrounding the models in an ML stack. 
Um, and, you know, it was, you know, once upon a time when people started becoming super excited for this, they were reading, you know, what Google and Amazon were doing. They were doing super fancy, cool models uh, on AI and everybody wants to do that the same. And then some tool came and helped democratizing this, you know, think of, you know, TensorFlow or Keras, whatever. And so now more people can actually do, you know, this, this fancy machine learning model, but then this barrier after you build the model in your laptop, there's this incredible barrier that you find of like, what happens to this model? Like, how do I actually push it to production? How do we actually deploy it to make an impact? Uh, now, we're even in another phase when, you know, of the, of the pre-trained models, where we don't even have to train models much anymore, at least in some, in some fields like the NLP, for example. Um, so Google, Amazon, or I can face whatever you want, pre-trained model, you kind of fine tune them. And then again, you'll go back to the problem before, which is you try and deploy them. But when you look at what happens outside of, you know, big tech or very, very advanced company, you find out that in reality, everything that happens after training is sort of broken. Like the first wave of democratization of tools, like let's say Keras, kind of work up to a point that now people, you know, out of university of where just some of your experience can take some data and produce something on their laptop, but still everything around them is still, I think, in, in its infancy. Oh, sorry, I randomly clicked on the wrong part of the, of the thing. So general trend number one, uh, well, models are becoming more and more a commodity, uh, especially in some fields, uh, when a lot of the you know, heavy lifting is done by pre-training actually in huge data sets, um, and data pipelines are actually competitive advantage. Um, as everybody can kind of you know, download a model from you know, Eigenfence or whatever, what is gonna distinguish your company from something else is gonna be what you do before you actually do import from Magin phase and what you do after you train your model. The second point, which is you know, the entire point of today is that you know, outside of a few, again, B2C gigantic company, the vast majority of your modeling needs can be met with off the shelf tools, um, which means that it's a fantastic moment to be doing this job, mostly because you don't have to do much anymore. Uh, this is just, you know, like a, like, like a quick overview of some of the best tools according to us, to our experience on basically all the things that concord to make a model from data to production, right? So you have, you have services for serving, you have services for data, you can do data transformation, you can do auto ML, you know, as Piero will, will, will teach you, uh, you know, you can do training in clusters, you can visualize stuff, um, you know, with, with an open source and past services. And then you can use, of course, anything you want to do orchestration, let's say prefect, astronomer, uh, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the things that used to be something that you need to build, now you can just buy or download. And what we're trying to do is trying to put all that knowledge and all those tools, which can be you know, overwhelming with the amount of choices that there is, and put it online with an open source repo, which is called, you don't need a bigger bot, of course, um, and it's a joint collaboration with my fine colleagues, when you actually show people at reasonable scale that not whole hope is lost. So then there's a way to go from the data that's in some warehouse or in your laptop, whatever, to an endpoint that is actually serving the prediction of the model that you just trained. And you can do that with off the shelf tool. Okay, you can do that without any, any DevOps experience. You can do that without any devoted team. You can do that without talking to any other engineering component of your, of your, of your company or startup, okay? Uh, the problem that we're tackling, again, to make it realistic, is the intent prediction problem, which we actually mentioned before, right? Again, it's, it's a very standard problem in e-commerce. Let's say you're browsing on a website. Can we predict if we're going to buy or not? And so what happens is that, you know, that you, you, get, a, you get a data set when there's our sessions, and, you know, which is people browsing on a website, and at some point they buy. You know, like on the left, they buy it, then no buy. This is your training set. Then you train a neural model, and then you can kind of, you know, deploy it. This is a new model. The user coming in, and every time they click on something, let's say they're watching, um, I don't know, they're sort of looking at the at the soccer shoes, and the model says, well, we don't think it's likely to buy. Then you know, they, they change your mind. It's like, oh, this shirt will like it. Why? So it's it's a very it's a very common use case in commerce. And the important thing is that, well, there's plenty of tutorials and blog posts around the internet on data pipelines and tooling. Like all the tools that we shared before, you can find you know, dozens and dozens of, I don't know, towards data science pieces. But for good reason, they tend to focus on one tool at a time. And also for very good reason, they tend to work on toy world fashion, leaving us to wonder what happened when we actually run this you know, on, on a real data set that actually people care about. 
So what we try then do, again, to kind of help the community, like, you know, being not overwhelmed by this Cambrian explosion of tools, is to provide open source code that everybody can use that goes from raw data to a deployed endpoint serving prediction. So we're not focusing on one tool at a time, but we kind of build this pipeline that goes from, you know, raw data to the final product. And also we use a real data set. Like instead of using, you know, a made up data set or, you know, the equivalent of movie lens, we actually use a data set we release, which comprises dozens of millions uh, of events, which again is representative of this reasonable scale we're talking about. When you put it all together, uh, so this is the picture that you get. Uh, we provide two different ways of doing this. So one is called the warehouse flow, which is the full flow that starts from the data that you have in Snowflake with final model deployed in SageMaker that you can call from your browser end to end, and you can actually run it you know, in a dockerized uh, fashion with one command. Um, and it kind of contains all these best of breed tools that we discussed before. So what happens is that you fake the ingestion of these you know, millions and millions of rows in, in Snowflake, and then from Snowflake on, you're gonna have DBT to transform the data, you're gonna have great expectation to validate it, and then you're gonna have Metaflow as the core of our ML pipeline. And finally, when everything is okay, you just ship the model to SageMaker and voila, you actually have an endpoint running. If you really don't want to go to the trouble of setting up all these open source tool, we also provide you to start, but to give you still a glimpse um, of, of what it means to do end-to-end -end machine learnings, we do a local flow. Uh, where Metaflow here is used as the tool that actually orchestrates all the, all the steps. And this can be run you know, without basically you know, much, um, much setup on the other, on the other tools. A cool thing about Metaflow, I think you, have, you had Savin here um, some time ago. So I think everybody should, I mean, is maybe familiar with Metaflow. But the cool thing about Metaflow as a way to orchestrate your uh, machine learning uh, uh, graph is that you can pick which of the steps in your pipeline are going to run locally and which of these steps are actually going to run on the cloud, which makes Metaflow a perfect tool to swap in and out other tools. Uh, like for example, I don't know, weight and biases for tracking or rapids for you know, um, quick uh, data wrangling uh, while still keeping the same general you know, uh, Python lovely uh, like flavor. You, know, you work in a, in a context that you know and you can just pick for whatever st whichever step you want, you can just pick the best computation out of it. Uh, the cool thing about Metaflow is that it abstracts away all the infrastructure work for the people working on the model. So if you go and look at the code, you're gonna find out that you know, your job as an ML op, as an ML scientist is not really doing ML ops. Your job is just define which steps you want to run and then you know, use decorators to define which infrastructure needs to be there for these steps to run. And this is all completely abstracted away from you. So once you put it all together, which I think that's yes, perfect timing. So uh, you, you can find out that, well, Thanks to a lot of the MLOps innovation in the last 30, in the last, sorry, in the last like, you know, two, three years, um, you can do a lot of MLOps without much ops. As in, you can focus on, you know, the code uh, that runs the data, transform the data, um, and, you know, prepare the model um, without really worrying about any infrastructure. It turns out that if you want to run, you know, the nice flow that I, that I showed you before, you basically run it without deploying anything yourself or without really maintaining any services by yourself. So even very small teams that don't have de you know, dedicated you know, DevOps resources can actually do that. The second important point is that not all tools in this pipeline and probably in this ecosystem have the same historical importance. I think there's an analogy with a, with a sentence that I, I think David Hilbert make. It says, a paper is judged by how many papers it makes obsolete. Like the importance of a paper is, is, you know, is judged by that. And I think for tooling, it's kind of the same. The typical... Uh, the typical point we make is about Snowflake. Like once we, once, we, once we adopt this Snowflake, we could kind of stop using not just the MR on Spark, we could stop using Athena, we could stop using Redshift. Like we replace an entire set of tools that we have to just use one tool that was better than all of them combined. And typically, you know, as a rule of thumb, what handles computation, that is, you know, where, where the computation actually happened, let's say Snowflake or Metaflow, is of course more important in this pipeline. It will be harder to replace with other tools. Uh, the pipeline or the, you know, this, this idea of combining open source tools in DAGs is also very extensible. If you don't want even to do the model yourself, but let's say you want to use Ludwig, well, then there's, there's, a very, you know, there's a very clear position for that to be in, which is in a step in Metaflow in this case. Or let's say you don't want to use weight and biases like we use for tracking, but you're more used to comment. Again, 
there's a very easy way for you to swap in and out different tools that you, know, that you want to do. So the idea is that once you get the pipeline of the main important step done, you know, from data to, to the endpoint, you can actually switch you know, different tools in different positions if for whatever reason you have different preferences. And finally, which I think is the, is the most important thing for people at reasonable scale is that there's been a lot has been said about you know, the peculiarities of AI compared to software businesses. You know, there's, a, there's a very famous uh, you know, Andreessen uh, blog post about this. Um, well, I think the jury's still out because you know, AI as a, as a business is still relatively new. Uh, I think it's certain that for the first time, or at least better than you know, any time before the present, small teams can do incredible ML things thanks to this thriving ecosystem. So I want to leave like time for discussing. So we're gonna skip the part about model cards, um, but you know you have the slide, so you can you can actually check it out. And so what, what's 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 left for people that work at reasonable scale? Well, we we kind of kind of just scratch the surface, right? So progress in you know in the entire ML uh, is done you know with with many with many things. It's done with data. It's done with research. It's done with code. It's done with their best practices. And when there's a lot of people that talks about data set and research and code and best practice, again, for five or 10 or you know, 15 companies in the world, there's very, very few out there, um, you know, the very few people out there that talks about all these things for a reasonable scale. And we try to do our you know, small and somewhat negligible part in this ecosystem. Um, but we just released like a huge data set if you want to, if you want to play with it, which was the subject of the SIGA Yari Commerce Data Challenges this year. Uh, of course, we try and continue to do research and we try and share like the repo that we just show and try and share free code and best practices. Oh yeah, we actually set up your company to, you know, to run ML at reasonable scale. Uh, we're just at the beginning, like as another famous guy said, you know, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty that needs to be done. Uh, one one big, big theme I think for, for us in general and for all the people at reasonable scale is once we solved once and for all this data pipeline issue, you know, once we really, once every company can really run data from, you know, the ingestion to the, to the, to the final, you know, endpoint, what happens there? How do we monitor what happens when the model is online, right? Um, in particular, you know, you can test as much as you want offline, let's say recommender system A against recommender system B, but everybody that actually work in the field know that, you know, online testing, A-B testing, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, the golden standard for, you know, uh, causal analysis. How do we make that monitoring, maybe testing work at scale? Again, not assuming that reasonable companies has, you know, unlimited, you know, amount of resources and a limited amount of knowledge. So yeah, we, 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 can, we can see plenty in the future needs to be done. And, you know, as I always say, let's not forget, you know, it's up to us to get it done. Thanks so much. And please ask any question you may have. Uh, thanks so much, Jacopo. Uh, great talk and uh, uh, really enjoyed kind of, uh, you know, the broad kind of uh, uh, discussion of all these issues. Uh, I want to remind folks in the audience, feel, feel free to send in questions on the YouTube live chat. We, we keep monitoring them and, uh, you know, we'll uh, get those across to Jacopo. Um, so I guess to kick things off, I'm curious about um, your take on kind of the explosion of uh, ML ops tooling and startups and and kind of the area generally, it seems like there's uh, just a ton of tools. Like every, feels like every month there are like five new tools that come out and they don't necessarily, you know, overlap perfectly, right? You talked about this a little bit with how, you know, some tools attempt to consolidate some of the work that previous tools might've done. Uh, and I'm wondering how you think about kind of this evolution in terms of that diagram and chart you had. So I couldn't resist, you know, going to your, uh, to your GitHub page. And I saw that, you know, your diagram in the talk uh, has an you know additional uh, some tweaks in, in the GitHub, for example, you now have a monitoring uh, thing with Gantry. Uh, yeah. and Josh actually gave a talk on the seminar series. Yeah. Uh, so so there's there's definitely you know an evolution in terms of what the right workflow should look like, and I'm curious how you think about those issues in in, in light of you know the number of tools that are coming out every day. Uh, so as a gen so as a practitioner, my my first reaction is well that's super cool, right? Again. All these things, if you think of, you know, going back four years, most of these things you have to do they yourself, right? And again, at, especially again, at, in, in smaller companies, smaller startups, nobody has these resources to do the monitoring and, you know, the deploy all at the same level. So it's great that now there are companies and the ecosystem is big enough so that companies can, you know, hopefully be successful and, you know, and make a living out of providing, you know, 
very specialized and very good tools for each of these components. But as a practitioner that on the practical side, you know, more on the less philosophical side is also overwhelming. Like as, a, as I actually try to keep up with all of that, as you, as you nicely point out, there's even a difference between my slide, you know, which comes from a paper that is very recent, but then the, you know, the repo is even more recent, right? <laughs> because repos tends to, you know, tends to age better than, than papers, <laughs> especially on these things. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really hard to keep up. Um, and and the, I, I think we are, as I said, I think we are in a privileged position for, um, for people, the ones that have a startup, or again, they're maybe a small team in a more traditional company, and they're starting the journey. And I think we can give back to them what we learn on our, on our, you know, on our own, all the mistakes we made ourselves. And we're in a privileged position for, well, it was, I have a lot of free time. Sorry, don't tell anybody, but a lot of free time. So I can try all these tools, uh, which is great. Um, and uh, and we we kind of had the problem of being the early adopter in the you know in the you know in the fake Gartner quadrant that we came up with right but we kind of we live that every day for for years right so it would be I would have loved like I am my first customer here in the sense that when I try to 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 try a new tool with a team I always try to go back with my mind of the time when our resources were really capped and asking myself would have been helped to have this. You know, to I don't know, make one less hiring, or you know, even have the same type of hiring, but having people freed up to do more meaningful things. And I think that's the that's the that's the important thing. A quick follow up, I guess. Um, you know, this is kind of related to something uh, that was posted in chat by Eggy five four five, which is you know, if, for example, the question was like, where is feature store in the ecosystem? So I'm curious, like, how you think about kind of variance of the you know diagram that you had. You know, maybe it's not one size fits all, but you know, you want maybe people to think about how that workflow should be structured and there might be different components that people need depending on their use case. Very good question. Again, the, the repo actually featured the, the feature store, so there's a note there. Uh, so, but the point is, so there is an historical reason why feature store is not there, is that because the way in which our, our old data pipeline was set up, we kind of built, like we kind of invented the feature store before it was a thing. Uh, for all sorts of the way in which data was ingested and prepared. So in this particular case, uh, the data that you find out, it doesn't really need that. So that's kind of the reason why it's not in this in the slides. But if you go in the repo, we're actually going to include FIST as the next iteration. So people will actually see how that will, will work out. That said, we provide some sort of what we think a cookie cut, like, you know, some sort of template when the important part is the steps and the way in which you conceptualize the division of labor between the steps. And then if you want to swap, you know, weight and bias it with Comet, you know, it's, it's really easy once you know how this tool, you know, which role this tool play. If you don't want to, again, build your model, you want to use Ludwig, that's, it's even, you know, that's easy. If you want to use Orbo to scale up your GPU within Metaflow, we did that. It's also super easy. So we, we're not saying that we know one size fit all, but at the terabyte scale, my point is that once you, once you kind of, have this principle in mind, the variation tends, the, the actual variation, the meaningful variation is actually not much. Like the variance is explained by very few things, right? And then of course you can come to me and say, well, astronomer is very different than prefect. Okay, you know, maybe, okay. But, but once you swap astronomer and prefect and you kind of keep the general idea, everything else stays together. So I think that's, that's kind of a general tool. But yes, feature store are super cool. Awesome, thanks, great answer. Actually, I have a follow up on this, which is, um, I believe that this is like this architecture is a really nice um, crystallization of best practices to a certain extent, right? In the, in the form of code, in the form of also structure, if you want, right? Um, one interesting aspect, I believe, is the fact that um, although there's always new new tools some new tools may actually change what is a best practice and can potentially even change what is, um, you know, these clearly defined boxes may actually not be as clearly defined anymore to a certain extent. And so it's like, for what are you thinking about future proofing, you know, um, the, the architecture and the structure that you are defining, Jacopo, with the, um, with the possibility of tools uh, redefining the best practice and redefining what it needs, um, uh, what, what it need, what it means to be like a, a monitoring tool, or what it means to be like a feature store, what it means to be like an automel tool. 
That's a very good question. And my answer is disappointing, but architecture are not set in time. The idea of refactoring is built in with the concept of architecture. Like the idea that you design architecture and there's a one-time thing and then you, you go back to that every five years, it's, it's a recipe for disaster, especially in this field. So this is what I believe today. Honestly, this is what I believed you know, a month ago with the, with the paper. And then today I already believe a new thing in the repo. And then if you go back to the repo, you're going to find something else in the month. But I don't think that's a problem. I, mean, I think that's a, that's a feature. There's not a bug. Like As in, when new things come on, you, you kind of readapt what you know. That said, the, the paradigm shifting thing, even in this, I, I think they're like, set, like seven tools or something like that. And they're all awesome. And we like them and we use them. But there's a difference between an experiment tracking tool and a snowflake. You know, this also reflecting develop. You know, this also reflecting you know very easy thing to you know, in very easy you know microscopic feature of reality like you know valuation, right? Like Snowflake is a paradigm is a is a shifting is a you know is a is a paradigm shifting thing. Um, uh, other tools are super you know are more niche by by definition. There's nothing you know there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. But when Snowflake came along, we we again we kind of retired three different technologies. Very very few tools requires you to do that in this one fell swoop, right? And it's why, you know, Snowflake is an is a, is a era-defining company in, in some sense, right? Uh, I, I, the other tool that for us was, was a change was Metaflow. Like I, I feel like, a, like something that's like, oh, oh my God, this is finally something I can use. Um, before we were using something like, I don't know if you know Luigi or, you know, other Python way to, because our ML scripts, you know, I mean, probably yours, is, I mean, maybe not yours, but like, you know, a lot of people have like stitching together different parts of this, of the script. And then you want to, re to play them in some, some reliable way, right? And Luigi was awesome, but it's not for an ML word, right? Luigi is for Python script glue together. And, and kind of metaphor for me is Luigi for a, meta for a, for a machine learning world. And, and they have this nice connection with infrastructure. So that part is also important. Every other tools around, um, I think, I think is, I mean, is that likely to be as, you know, as, as, you know, as stable as this one? I can totally see that changing. I mean, we built our first company with Airflow and now we're using Prefect, right? So even ourselves, we made different decisions in, in these type of things. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much for the answer. Hey, Jacopo, one of the things that really struck me about uh, one of your slides was that slide where you kind of showed how much of the research in e-commerce was coming from like the, the, the big companies. Um, I'm wondering, what would you kind of say to the ML research community to try to get them to you know, think about or start working on kind of ML at this like reasonable scale? Like, how would you suggest like, if there's an interested researcher out there, maybe in the audience, how, how do you suggest like to them to get involved and think about what are the relevant problems and how do things kind of change when you're looking at this more reasonable scale as opposed to, you know, the, the giant companies? So, I mean, we, we should probably be better at ourselves at advertising our work just to show that, you know, that, that it's possible to do that. Uh, but we really suck at all such a, you know, such a network and things, so that will probably get better. We, we tried and did like the data challenge this year as CIGAR was on reasonable scale. And the funny thing is that companies from unreasonable scale are Rakuten and NVIDIA actually came and participate and, you know, and, and kind of compete in, you know, our sort of problem. So that's, that's, that's totally happening already, you know, in, you know in like, you know, baby steps. Uh, but the other thing that I want to say to people doing ML at smaller startup, they still want to do cutting they still want to do cutting edge thing is um, you probably need to fix your engineering first. Like if you want to do good ML, like, you know, replicable experiments, you know, reliable data and so on, this thought, this ML ops comes before ML research. And I think one giant barrier to entry to people doing interesting work at the recommender system or even taking cutting edge recommender system and apply them to their shop is this ML ops thing. You know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not the, you know, the particular loss function or, you know, the architecture or whatever is literally that even if I read the paper and I understand everything, then there's no way for me to bring that into reality. So my suggestion for people at reasonable scale is fix data and ML ops first. Like give your people or give yourself like a nice developer experience, like a, like a, like a setup so that you are productive and, you know, you can run these experiments well. And then the results in machine learning research will come. If you have good question, there's a lot of interesting stuff at reasonable scale, a lot, because you don't have that much data, but this also forces you to be a bit smarter, right? 
Right. Because if we can just brute force my way out of with Transformers, right. of course, that's cool. But that said, you know, it's also not so interesting. And I mean, I don't know. But to me, is you know, it's relatively interesting. Okay. But now when I need to personalize the experience of somebody that has three data points, well, we need to come up with better ideas. And so I think reasonable scale is, a, you know, is a lot of, again, underserved market of ideas, even before underserved market of, you know, ML tools. Right. What do you think is kind of like the biggest barrier to entry for, for people kind of setting up that first like decent ML ops pipeline? Um, you know, if they, is it just, you know, you know, they need to find your GitHub and then like go, go run with it. Or do you, do you think there's actually something more subtle, more, more challenging for somebody kind of getting into the space for the first time? Uh, it, it's trivial, but 99% of the problem that I saw in different organization is data. Like data is never where it should be. Uh, where it's where it should be is not in the shape that it should be. Um, and where it's in the shape that it should be, you cannot access it because of some security, you know, random rule that somebody made up. Uh, and so it's very hard to get consistent data flowing into your model. The model part is one that everybody, I think now, you know, you, know, you, you can get a collab or, you know, your notebook and, you know, can kind of figure it out. You know, you can stack overflow your way out of modeling at this point in time which is great. It means that way more people can do this, you know, in, in scale. Uh, but you can stack over for your way out of a good data warehouse. Like how to actually, you know, prepare data in a good way, it's still more an art of a science. And, you know, there's a lot of best practices that are not as known and as, I don't know, done over fit to a test set. It's not the same type of, you know, best practice that everybody knows on the other side of the fence. But yes, data is the first thing. And of course, the other one is deploying it, right? Because if I build a model and now I have to call with three other teams and first security people, you know, and, and, you know, engineers to just have the models in production and see if people use it, uh, that's going to be a huge barrier for, you know, younger folks or more or less mature startup that just starting out. While if you have this end-to-end -end pipeline that you do understand and that is serverless, uh, you don't have to deploy literally anything, then I think will give you a better chance to see the result of your work um, in production. Cool. Uh, thanks for that huh? answer. Along those lines, Jacopo, um, I have a kind of open-ended question for you. Um, so if you put yourselves into the context of like one of these reasonable scale companies that come across your GitHub and want to uh, set up their ML pipeline, how many Jacopos do they need to actually support this pipeline? And you know, if that answer isn't just one of you, then what are the pain points that prevent it from being just one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, hopefully they have better people than Jacopo, so I need to rescale Jacopo's to best to you know to good people. But even doing the conversion Jacopo to good engineers, I think I think we I mean we have reasonable evidence that you know two or three people can run terabyte scale machine learning models that are good enough to go to you know to to win a paper and knuckle and good enough to be in front of in case of two or more than a hundred million people in three years, right? Uh, and three people is not a lot. Like it's really, it's really, not, it's really, it's really not a lot. Um, but it, it comes from this decision of never using people time to do infra to do infrastructure things. Right? It, it comes from this our obsession with never use time to do something that is not immediately valuable. And since we are not an infrastructure company, and very few people are working in infrastructure company, infrastructure per se is not a value. Like your company is not going to be worth more because, you know, <laughs> infrastructure or, you know, so, and there's a lot of people that do that very well. Again, on the data side, Snowflake, on, you know, on the serving side, I mean, AWS does basically everything now as a service, right? Um, so I think there's evidence that very, very few people can run terabyte scale machine learning operations with those type of ideas and tools, you know, adjusted to your, to your, to your own, to your own, to your own thing. Um, I, I think... I mean, I cannot quote them, but I think Netflix is a company that's been obsessed with, like, for example, local, like non-distributed computing. So if they can get away, you know, being some of the best models in the industry with clever tricks to not do distributed computing, I think you, uh, you know, with a GPU, AWS batch, you know, you can go way, you can, you can, there's a long, there's a long way of things you can do with you, your laptop, and AWS batch on Metaflow. Like a lot of things you can do. This is actually making me think of something, Jacobo, which is, um, I believe, so if a company like, you know, Netflix can get away with that, it means that, you know, many, many people can get away with that. Although when, when I, um, you know, sometimes speaking with um, 
companies and people for companies that maybe today are doing reasonable scale ML, but they want to get to the point where they do unreasonable scale ML, right? They want to get, they want to become Amazon. They want to, their, their ambition is to get there. Um, I would say, what is the Delta there? What is that something like what you showed built mostly from like open source components? Um, where, where would that break if you were to work at, you know, uh, petascale at a scale level? And is there like a path for those, someone uh, adopting like a, an architecture like the one that you described to actually then uh, that architecture to grow with them to the scale they want to be? Yeah, that's so the, I, I didn't do the transition myself as I, as I didn't became Amazon, I didn't become Jeff Bezos, you know, yet for now. So I'm still, you know, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still on hurt at least. Um, but the, but there's a couple of things we can actually, you know, you know, as bad as it is, we can armchair engineering just by looking at the bottlenecks of, of, the, of, of what I presented, right? So the computation, if you look at the, the real computation happens in three places, right? The Snowflake, which is data aggregation, which is basically you're, you're querying your data aggregating it and preparing it for you to be, you know, training ready. And I'm pretty sure the net is not can do better by scale. Um, so I, I don't know, know how much has been tested after that, but I'm pretty sure they, they can do that. So maybe, I don't know, Uber cannot, at Uber that will cost, I don't know, like a fortune. Uh, but I still think it, it, it will scale a bit with you. Uh, then of course, there's the model. And, you know, that means, you know, scaling GPUs outside of the, you know, whatever it is, for eight of AWS batch max. I don't remember what's the max now, um, which means, I don't know, any scale, you know, we can do a ray cluster or, I mean, all the things that, that, that you guys know and, and talk about. Um, and I think that part is being commoditized a bit as well. So I think now scaling training to, you know, not a thousand GPUs, but, you know, like, you know, maybe, you know, 24, 30, 50, I think that's been, that's been getting, is getting better. And finally, the serving, which is the third bottleneck, right? And if, if yes, if you run SageMaker on a company makes you know, millions of prediction, you know, per minute, you're gonna you're gonna pay Amazon bill, you're gonna pay millions of dollars in Amazon bill. So that probably doesn't you know doesn't doesn't work that well. Um, but I yes, so the path would be th that to keep in mind that when you arrive to the point of running a reasonable scale, it means you're expecting from this pipeline, uh, you know, billions of dollars in in revenue, right? Uh, and these tools will buy you enough time for you. The tool will scale with you in an expensive fashion. I do understand it, but will scale with you a bit for you to make the decision if you really, if it's really worth the trouble of you know reinventing some of these tools in your architecture or not. Like it's very unlikely that one day you're a reasonable scale and the other day you're Amazon, right? It's not. It's not doesn't happen in a day. And this tool, which the cool thing of serverless or pass in general, that you know they will scale up. You know they they will stretch with you. And they will give you time to think which of these tools is going to break first. So which of this bottleneck is more important for me to fix first? And honestly, do I really want to go there? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. One of the things that I'm getting from it is that cost is a main driver there rather than the technology itself in many of these places in the architecture, which is you know, a really interesting thing and could be the reason why you know, companies like, for instance, Google's of the world or the Facebook of the world's create more bespoke things because, you know, they don't want to pay this cost to someone else, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of cost. So the other thing about server, like about general, this open source and new tooling is that the biggest cost is always people. I know that it doesn't look like it because you don't get a, an AWS bill with a number on it, but the time and the frustration and, you know, and, and, you know, and the amount of, you know, retention and hiring, like all that involved for people to rebuild services that other companies are, you know, are doing, it's a lot. Like it's really a lot. Like before that becomes a reasonable expense. I mean, of course, if you're Facebook, but honestly, who is Facebook? Like I would strongly, strongly, strongly recommend against hiring for this specifically. That's a horrible use of your money. Like a hard. It's way better to pay Jeff a bit more money in GPU so that you can go to space again and so on. It's way better as an expense to do that. Then now to manage an army of people and to make them happy and you know and to basically rebuild everything that you know that, that some that Amazon is doing already. I completely agree. Um, Jacopo, I uh, you know I want to get in maybe a last question that uh, uh, sure. gives you something to think, think through. 
as well. Um, so I'm curious about, you know, you're kind of in a unique position because you've done all this, you know, work in, in actually kind of understanding the whole landscape of uh, how to build ML, you know, workflows end to end. Uh, and so I'm curious what you think about are as good opportunities for both researchers, uh, you know, like, like us and, um, you know, people in industry and, and developers who might be looking to build new things in this area. Where do you think are like the biggest bottlenecks that you're seeing today? And, and where you think some of the stuff that you talked about, about consolidating tooling could actually happen, uh, you know, in the next few years? So there's, there's a bunch of data that I think are super interesting for, for, for people that are kind of starting now, like, like, like you young guys, you know, young and full of energy, not like me and Piero, you know, almost retiring now. Uh, so one, one for me is what I, what I said at the, at, the, at the end, which is, well, you deploy your model in production. Congratulations, but that's not a goal in itself, right? The goal is that the model does something better than you know, the, the other model and whatever you had before. And all that, that things around there, it's interesting, right? Uh, monitoring and A-B testing comes to mind first, but they think about all the time that you cannot really do A-B testing. Like uh, I read a paper the other day of uh, subscription services and like, well, when we buy a movie for this subscription platform, right? How do we know that people subscribe to this platform because we have this movie and not the other one, right? And we can't really A-B test that, right? So that's causal analysis. And all that is kind of a new field. There's a lot of things from them in other fields, which I suggest you to read, you know, causal analysis are very, causal identification, it goes, you know, goes back, you know, to, to philosophy, econometrics, and statistics. But there's a lot of that with the recent machine learning tools that we can do at a much bigger data scale. So I think that's a super interesting research problem that combines making engineering tools, you know, like matter and nice scientific work on the, on the, on the, on the data side. Um, and for me, the other thing is like language. This is my thing, like language is my thing. And this natural language processing now is, you know, as you know, is this golden age when you can import, you know, pre trained model and you look like a smart guy. So that's awesome, uh, but also not really awesome. Uh, and so on that, I will, I will suggest young people like you with a full of energy. So you can do more than import tagging face like me and Piero do all the time. And you can actually come up with some good ideas, uh, you know, to save us from this, you know, incredibly boring time of energy. No, that, that, that's a great answer. And, uh, you know, I, I think this has definitely been one of the more entertaining uh, <clears throat> podcast discussions that we've had. So thank you so much for that. We got some uh, good, good uh, quotes there. Um, yeah, I, I just want to thank you for, you know, giving this talk. And I want to thank everybody in the audience for, for tuning in today. Um, you know, go to, go to uh, you know, Jacopo's um, uh, GitHub page that he, he talked about. You don't need a bigger boat. Um, it's on GitHub and it's, it's really good. Uh, we'll link that in the description as well. Um, and, you know, uh, next week we're going to have Suman uh, Jana, who's going to talk about a scalable, accurate, robust binary analysis with transfer learning. So uh, thanks, everyone, and see you next week. Ciao.